kasi mga uh, full-time as the head of the Bible Theology Department. Madalas kami ang magka-partners sa ministry. We're glad that's not not broken. Pero hindi ako matataan later on sa na iba na not not broken. We praise the Lord for how we had uh, been using, uh, we have used our speaker sa so, ministry sa PBS, ngayon at sa US, at alam ko,
Exodus 36, so Deuteronomy 36, Exodus 32, 1 to 4, Exodus 32, 1 to 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Exodus 32, 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Ah, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And you received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made the golden cup. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be the feast of the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down to your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it. Said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may be burned up against them, and I may consume them in order that I may take a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn up against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, the eagle then did we bring them up, to kill them in the mountains, and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised. I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that we had spoken, bringing on his people. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of the Lord produces it. The Lord will bless us, and I will give this word. So again, I'm going to talk about this theme, a heart for God. Puso. Puso para sa Pokemon. Siguro dapat unang nakita ko na yun. Puso na ito para sa it's not because of our own work, it's not because of our own ability, it's not because of our own ingenuity. It is a gift. It is a gift. When we talk about the curse of sin and the death of man's depravity, we don't have the ability to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the verse that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, gives us this principle that whatever God demands, whatever God commands, He grants. He graciously grants. God said, I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. So it is God who changed our heart. And it is God who is empowering us. And it is God who is enabling us to what? Love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the first principle is this, very basic, God loved us first. So apart from the love from God that we receive through Jesus Christ, we will not be able, we cannot and we will not be able to love it with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this heart of God is powerfully renewed, it is going down, and I'm also going. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So this heart is powerfully renewed by the grace of God or by the Almighty God, and it is progressively transformed by God Himself. Transformed into the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The one who is faithful, the one who can say there is one God and there is one Lord, and the one who is able to love the Father with all his heart, soul, and strength. Jesus Christ. So yesterday we look at the object of uh, that love, and I believe that this is foundational to the great Shema. So Shema, Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad, and the Asis about it speaks about God as the God of the covenant. structure this 
uh, message with this uh, four points. We will begin with the confession, uh, the Westminster confession about the Covenant 7 1. And then we will look at uh, John Calvin, our, our well known reformer. And then uh, we will answer the question what hinders our total devotion? And then we will end with a material of two mountains. Okay? In Exodus 33, we could uh, see there the Mount, the, the, the Mount Sinai. There, Moses receiving the commandments from the Lord. And then we will look at the mountain of uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. So, confession. Westminster Confession 7 1. Are you, are you familiar with the Westminster uh, Confession? This is our mantra at, 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 West, at, at Westminster. We talk about covenant uh, relationship. In fact, when I uh, finish, when I did my uh, final exam with uh, Dr. Oliphant, uh, he asked us to uh, write down Westminster Confession 71 and to explain what that uh, means. And I hope that uh, you will also uh, take the time to read it and uh, if you can memorize it. Uh, Westminster, I'm not, I'm not converting it to uh, anything, I just uh, found this uh, uh, something uh, important and that would also uh, give us an understanding or would, would clarify or somehow, somehow reinforce what I'm going to go speak about this, uh, this morning. So the distance between God and man and or the creature is so great. Now when we talk about the distance, we're not just talking about what? 100 miles away, 1,000 miles away. No. We're talking about the distance that we call ontological distance. We're talking about the being of God and the being of man. That, that there's a chasm, that there's a distance when we talk about the being and the ontology of God, there's a distance between God and His creature. That although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto Him, as their creator, yet they could never have any fusion of him as their blessedness and uh, reward. But by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he had been pleased to express by way of father. Now, when we talk about the great Shema, the great, uh, the great Shema, or the passage that we read, is, uh, is actually uh, uh, built within the context. Of a covenant. In fact, some of the commentators that, uh, uh, some of the uh, commentaries that I, I read, they said that this is just like a uh, he type treaty. It's about the relationship between the suzerain and the blackout. That uh, when you look at the structure of uh, the, the book, it starts with a prologue, a preamble. What is the preamble? I am your God. And there's a historical uh, problem about the mighty acts of uh, God, and there are general stipulations, specific uh, stipulations. There are witnesses, and there are blessings and and, uh, and curses. That will uh, also help us to see the structure of the uh, of the book. So it's built within the context of a covenant. So what is the role of God when, 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 when we talk about this uh, covenant, when we talk about this relationship, the relationship of God's people with their creator, with their redeemer, with their savior, with their uh, God. Well, God is sovereign in this covenant. This covenant is sovereignly disposed by God and not negotiated by the two uh, parties involved. So he is the Lord of the covenant. And so the army can be uh, treated as a as a covenant document. A covenant document. Just, uh, uh, just appreciate how it, uh, how the Lord uh, Jesus Christ uh, mentioned in uh, the Gospels so that He came not to abolish the law, but to uh, fulfill it. If you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the one who fulfilled this document. He came not to abolish, He came to uh, fulfill it. Now when we uh, do this, do this, uh, this, 
the sacrament, the Lord's uh, uh, supper, uh, supper. Um, we would mention that phrase, talking on blood. speaks about the blood of Jesus Christ and how he has fulfilled this, uh, the, the righteous one who bore the curse of sin so that all of us as people would become one, would, would receive this blessing from the Lord, the blessing of life, the blessing of uh, salvation. So the word Yahweh, every time that you would see that, especially in the Old Testament, if you would see that word Lord in all capital letters, it's the covenant name of God. It means personal, he's powerful, relational, resplendent, and glory, majestic, he is mine. So that's uh, Yahweh, it means that he is faithful to his uh, is covenant. So in the uh, covenant relationship, the imperatives to hear, hear, O Israel, and the imperative, the injunction to uh, love is uh, actually rooted and founded on uh, on God's on God's grace, on what God, on who God is, and what the Lord has uh, has done. So the distance is so great and it was the Lord who taken the initiative to reveal himself to his people and that renders all men all men so when we talk about this knowledge this implanted knowledge this longing that we have for a higher a higher being it is because of that God has revealed himself and he created us in his own image God says that the essence of this image is what? What is the essence of this image? The essence of the image of God is fellowship. All of us are covenant creatures. All of us. It is either in Christ as covenant keepers or in Adam as covenant breakers. Not only because of that implanted knowledge, but because of the fact that we were created in God's image, and we long for fellowship, we long for communion with the one who created us. So the uh, imperatives here, to hear and love, are covenant stipulations addressing Israel as God's covenant people. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. He is our covenant God. It means that He reigns, He rules, that He is the God of the covenant. And when you read chapter 30, verse 6, command something, he grants it. He is not only glorious, he is also good, and he is gracious. Let's look at uh, John Calvin. In one of his uh, letters to his uh, friends, he wrote, For new dignity of air of the meaning, pumpkin and sincere. sincere. It means, I offer my heart to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. I offer my heart to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. That would also become our our prayer today. And I was listening to the prayer. Uh, my brother was saying that Lord, I want to offer my life to you. Take everything up in my heart, up in my life to uh, you. You know, John Paulin also had this experience of uh, being being wrong by the members of the church. There was once a time when he left Geneva because they tackled a lot of issues against him. And so he left the, uh, he left the church. And the church went downhill. And you know, John Paul, his father, a very uh, pious, uh, pious man. And there came a time when the church of Geneva asked him to come back. If you were just about it, people wronged you, people offended you, people hurt you. Are you gonna come back? Are you gonna return? You know what? You know what uh, John Hawkins uh, said in one of his letters to uh, to his uh, friend. He said it. It was only John Hawkins who say this uh, letter, so I would, I would quote it. So, had I the choice at my own disposal, nothing would be less agreeable to me than follow your advice. 
twice. You get twice of this friend, do not return, do not come back. But when I remember that I am not my own, I offer up my heart presented as a sacrifice to the Lord. Here it is. When I remember that I am not my own. When, when Moses addressed Israel as Israel, he's, he's reminding them. He's reminding them that they are God's that they are in a privileged position. Again, it is a group, it is a gracious election. It is a gracious choice. Not because they were men, not because there was something good in them. It is because God is gracious and God is grace. And, and God is glorious and God is great. That, that, the, uh, that God shows them sovereignty and freely. Well, um, John Calvin would uh, always uh, remind himself of his uh, two things every time that there would be a temptation. A temptation. Not to uh, fully commit himself to uh, the Lord. You know, in our journey with, with God, there would be days of challenges, you would be tried, you would be tested. Yourself, you can see, see yourself in a difficult or a despondent situation, and then you will just hear yourself to say, I don't want to quit. I don't want to continue anymore. Well, for the BBCs, yes, there will be days of commitment. And again, the highest covenant blessing is the presence of God. He will not abandon you, He will not, he will not forsake you. God will be with us. It's the common blessing for us, the presence of God. The Bible says, I am with you. But we know the sting of being hurt by someone. And we know the anxiety when it's time to pay for your tuition and your support. And you have not yet received your, uh, your, your, your support. And you're thinking about not only your studies here, you're thinking about your family, or maybe you are also going through some personal battering, you have issues with yourself, with other people. We, we know what it means to uh, see ourselves in, the, in this particular situation, and the only thing that we want to do is to do it. To be forget about our punch. You remember that man with his Christianity goodbye? You remember that I remember that person who taught me that that God is beyond our knowledge. When I was doing my I was doing a course at the University of the Philippines, I encountered someone who was formerly a member of a Christian uh, Christian church, but in that class, he was always criticizing me. He was always making fun of me. When he, when he sees me entering the classroom, he would, he would, he would say, oh, holy, 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 there's right song, and be this only person or something like that. So I felt awkward every time that I would attend this, uh, every time that I would attend this class. In fact, um, there was even a, uh, an exam, our final exam. He said that proof that, that God exists is not an indicative uh, statement. And I know in my heart that there is something that I will not be able to, uh, that, that I, will, I will do. I believe, that, I believe that God exists. So I just, I just told him, uh, sir, I would answer this based on the lessons that you taught us, but it doesn't necessarily follow that this is my conviction. I actually got one in that, uh, in that class. And in fact, we became good friends. When I defended my uh, topic, he was my, he was my advisor. But after he learned that I was already in the U.S. and uh, taking my, 
postgraduate uh, studies. I came back here two years ago and I uh, told him that I wanted to continue writing and uh, he said that I need to choose. You choose. You go back to the US or you will continue. So, uh, you know what I did? I chose to go back to uh, the US. Do you have any regret thoughts out there? Worship 
in a religious ceremony, our hearts are busy making idols and they hide most effectively among our daily pleasures. They fester long in the secret recesses of our hearts and lives. Dying about soft worth. Soft worth. Ernest Becker argues in his book, The Denial of Death, that our need for soft worth is the condition for our life. He said, every person is seeking cosmic significance. We want to feel significant. And what we want people to affirm our significance. Our drive to find self worth is so strong that whatever we base our identity and value on, we essentially deify it. So, in short, we make it as our God. We make it as our idol. And the Bible completely agrees with that assessment. Ezekiel 14 3. God is dealing with the problem of taking idols into our hearts. Idolatry in, this, in the scripture is a hard problem. This means all kinds of things can become idols for us. Colossians 3.5 Repeatlessness is idolatry. Philippians 2.19 People whose God is their very good is, uh, is idolatry. Sex, money, Children, work, sport, school, each of this, a whole and a whole lot more, transform themselves into hard idols. An idol can be a certain lifestyle, the idol of respectability or affluence, the idol of social connectedness. Remember that one who said, we kiss Christianity, but goodbye. When he considers his position about the LGBT as bigotry, and then we would see him now with a white network among this group, this group, the LGBT. Well, not in a position to point the finger of accusation, or point the finger of judgment. Others would like to sympathize, others would like to react. But let it be an example. A warning for all of us. You could be in the ministry and then all of us are away. All of us are away. All of us. So be warned. And talk about being attraction. What? What? Why idolatry is so attractive? And I will source our interests and promote our happiness at a fraction of a cost. It, it's, it is not that costly. It is not that costly. Someone asked. Is it, is it possible to believe in God? Is it, is it possible to have a decent life without obeying the Bible? Without believing, believing God? Remember this philosopher? He has a book and the title is Why Am I, Why Am I Not a Christian? Bertrand Russell. He said, I could be a decent person without believing in God. Being good is more than just having a decent morality. So that's the reason why people are attracted to idolatry. That the true God would require. It's not that costly. We want to make God manageable. We want to make Him useful. I came across this uh, book by uh, Kevin Young. And then he said, why idolatry is attractive? Number one, it was it was there. There's actually a promise. A promise of pleasure. It was selfish. It's all about one's personal consumption. It's all about one one's it's all about fulfilling one's desire. It was easy. There's, there's no moral responsibility. It was convenient. No need to go to the temple. You know, the Israelites needed to go to the temple to worship God. They built shrines in these places, several places, a lot of places. There were franchises all over the place for the people to worship God. It was normal in the ancient Near East, only the Israelites were not doing this because of their monotheistic belief. It was pleasing in the senses. When you look at 
have idols carving, gold, silver, beautiful scribes, listen to the senses. And it was what? It was indulgent. It was indulgent. The only thing that you need to do is to sacrifice for it. And according to them, your request will be granted. Adolf is so attractive. If we are not careful, it's easy for us to, uh, to see ourselves as a prey and we will easily fall. And we will easily fall. Exodus 32 talks about the absurdity of idolatry. Also, Psalm 150. That it is ridiculous to bow before our image, to make for ourselves an idol. It can never give you what your heart is looking for. Talking about covetousness. One thing, what others, what others have. I remember the time when uh, I was seeing all my classmates here and uh, they had their cell phone. And I know the tendency of my own heart seeing them being able to communicate with their parents and loved ones. And I didn't have a cell phone that time. I said to myself, cell phone. And I'm going to tell people to take one of them. If they want to make an antenna, parang pangkutkut ng yelo. Kaya yung mga cellphone. Kapag mayroon ka ngayon, tapos hindi snatch. Pag nakita ang snatch sa iyo, ay balik sa inyo. Ay, hindi na lang po. Ganyan yung mga cellphone. Dati, if they want to tempo, hindi na lang sa iyo. Lord, dati nung kaya yung mga Nokia, ay wala lang siya ng Nokia po. Pag may Nokia ka, so, so shout out. Lord, kahit yung Bosch, kahit yung Bosch pang gorilla, kahit yung Bosch na, na cell phone, kahit yung Bosch. And uh, a friend sold his, uh, his phone because he wanted to have uh, 51 pin. Because uh, I was the big phone at that time. So he sold it to me for only uh, 500 pesos. 500 pesos. And then I got a 51, I got a Bosch phone. Some of my classmates, they had a pretty one day. So, parang, uh, pretty kasi sa rin yung Bosch yung phone mo, yung mga classmates mo, pretty one day. But what's, what's the point here? You can never give you what your heart is looking for. But the moment that you got it, you will dump on your heart. You will dump on your heart. It will leave you as empty and lifeless and dead as these idols, as these images, as these icons. Remember what is written in Psalm 115? Those who made them will become like them. Like them. Empty, lifeless, dead. I like what Dr. Bill said. We become what we worship. The God that you made for yourself isn't much of a God. There's something or someone that stands in the place of God. Do you consider David by the Lord? Tell me right now. That's absurd. That is ridiculous. The assessment of my God in Exodus chapter 33. God said, Go down and see what they are doing. So my God said, Moses was there on the mountain having this face-to-face -face fellowship, this intimate fellowship, communion with God. And the people of God down there on the plain, they were what? Worshiping, serving the golden God. And God knows it. God told Moses, go down and see what they are doing. What's the point here? He knows. He knows my own kingdom. He knows that, 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 that something and someone is taking his place in my heart. Don't think that 
what you're doing is going all together unnoticed by God. Idolatry corrupts, idolatry discords, idolatry pollutes. Sin, the sin of idolatry is a deep war and a dead end is true. It goes to the heart like poison. And on our own, it's for those who have fallen away. Those who turn their back backs on the Lord, they will return. That is our only God. What's the cure for the sin of idolatry? What is the hope for the idolaters? In Exodus chapter 32, Moses served as the mediator. He pleaded for the Lord. Because the wrath of the Lord is upon his people. And we know that he's not the Lord. That Moses is a time and the anti time, the only mediator between God and man, the one who is pleading before the Father for his chosen ones, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. On Mount Sinai, God told Moses, Go down and see what we are doing. On Mount Sinai, God told His people, God told His people, worship me alone. And Jesus Christ believes it. Jesus Christ knows it. Jesus Christ asserts it when He was being tempted. Worship God alone on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's good that Moses was there. And that God Himself, the Father, telling Him, this one is greater than you, Moses. Greater than Elijah. The one who said, worship me alone, says on that mountain, this is my son. Listen to him. Here, we hear through him. We listen to him. We obey through him. Listen to him. He violated the first four commandments. The Shema is a positive restatement of this four, first four commandments. First commandment, you shall have no other gods can only be obeyed by worshiping Jesus. He's the one mediator. First Timothy 2, verse 5. He's the radiance of the glory and the exact imprint of his nature. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Again, the Shekham and discipline, Zechariah 49. He will be king over all the earth. He will be one. His name one. And what is his name? Jesus. Jesus said, John 14, 7, If you have known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus has the audacity to say, If you know me, you know God. There's one God. The sovereign God, you know Him. If you fear me, hear me, and love me, you worship God. The implication, therefore, if you don't know God in Christ, then you do not know God. You do not know God. We praise the Lord. In Christ, in Christ, we can be confident. We can know Him truly, and we can love Him fully. Going back to John Bowman, at the end of the letter, he said, He wanted to go back to Geneva to pass on the church. He said, It is enough that I live and die for Christ, who is all, who is to all. His followers, who is to all his followers, again, both in life and death. And death. It is enough. We live and die for him. This echoes what Paul said. To live with his Christ and to die is gain. What does it mean to hear God and to love God? 
it means giving in total devotion. God deserves our total and exclusive devotion and commitment. We can only do so through Christ. We pray that you will bless this work in our hearts and you will cause us to glorify you by obeying you. Looking up to Christ, who is our Father, through Him we can worship the true God, and through Him we can live a life that is glorifying and pleasing to you.